Well, we officially started the bridge project last Sunday, and I hope that you have made a decision to invest yourself and your time and your energy into doing some of the things that we've suggested you do this past week. We talked about bridges of devotion, connecting with God, and so we made several suggestions of things that you could do this past week. I know that I, I spent some time fasting from food. I also spent some time fasting, I guess you could say, from screens. And I'll be honest, I missed food a lot more than I missed my phone. <laughs> I don't know if you experienced that, but I actually did hear from some of you, and that's always good to hear that, uh, that you are participating and to get your insights. One of our young dads said that he and his family also spent some time fasting from their screens and memorizing scripture, and he said his children uh, did away with or, or uh, put aside for a while uh, these three things, jewelry, chips, and phone, which, you know, the three necessities of life, jewelry, chips, and phone. But I was proud of those children for doing that. And what a great example for all of us to deny ourselves some things so that, and that's the important part, so that, not just to deny ourselves some things, but to deny ourselves some things so that we look to God. In fact, uh, one of our young men here fasted from food one day, and he, he kind of kept me updated on how that was going. And he, and he paralleled his fast from food with his reliance on God. And he said, you know, when the day started, I really wasn't that hungry, and so I just sort of did my own thing. But throughout the day, I started getting more and more hungry, and that reminded me of, of my hunger for God or my reliance on God. And he said, by the end of the day, you know, I'm starving, and that's when I realized that I can't do this on my own, that I can't do life on my own, and that I look to God and that God provides for me. What a great lesson to be learned. And sometimes we need to get out of our comfort zone. Sometimes we need to stretch ourselves. Sometimes we need to deny ourselves to learn some of the lessons that God wants us to learn. So I'm thankful for those experiences. And I would say keep it up. Keep it up. Today we start a new chapter, if you will, a new emphasis on connecting with our community, bridges of engagement. And in that literature that we emailed you, that's in the bulletin, the cards out on the lobby, it's on our website, we have just several suggestions on ways that you can connect with your community. Maybe serve a neighbor of yours in some way. Find a way to to help them, to serve them. Maybe go on a neighborhood prayer walk. And just walk by the houses in your neighborhood or a nearby neighborhood and lift them up in prayer. Maybe you don't even know who lives in that home, but you can pray for them. I would encourage you to do something this week. Maybe it means getting out of your comfort zone. Maybe it means stretching a little bit. Certainly it means getting off of your easy chair, getting off the sofa and and doing something. And I think when you do that, God will show up and God will show you some things that you need to see. and He'll teach us and continue to shape us in the image of his son. You know, one of the challenges of this past week was to spend time in God's word. And we specifically recommended maybe read through 1 John. It's a great little book. So much insight. So many good things in that book. And so read through 1 John. Study 1 John. Meditate on 1 John. And so when I fasted from food that day, I decided that when I got hungry, I would go to the Bible. I would go to 1 John. Well, I spent a lot of time in 1 John that day. (laughs) And there were several things that stood out to me, but one passage in particular really sort of jumped off the page at me because I think it gets at the heart of this sermon series we're calling Bridges. It's in 1 John chapter 2, the end of verse 5 And verse 6. And the passage says this. It says, If we want to know that if we are in Him, this is how we will know if we are in Christ. Well, how will we know? This should be important. How will we know if we are in Christ? Because those who claim to live in Him live as Jesus did. That's it. Those who claim to know Christ, those who claim to be in Christ, they live a certain way. And the way they live is they live in a way that imitates Jesus in the way he lived. And Jesus did some very 
counterintuitive, countercultural things as he lived his life. And one of the things you'll notice about Jesus when you go to the Gospels is he was not afraid to make meaningful connections with people. Even if it meant taking risks, even if it meant putting a target on his back, even if it meant getting out of a comfort zone, Jesus was willing to do that. And so if we, who claim to be in Christ, are going to imitate Christ, we're going to live as Christ did, then that means we, too, will be willing to take risks. We will be willing to leave our comfort zones. We will be willing to invest whatever it takes to make meaningful connections with other people. Because that's what Jesus often did. He met people where they were. And so as you consider what God can do through you this week, let me encourage you to look at Jesus as your model, your example, and say to yourself, in this moment, maybe you're in a meeting, maybe you're in a phone conversation, maybe you're texting someone, maybe you're deciding, what am I going to do today? In that moment, say, what would Jesus do in this situation? What might Jesus do? What might he say? Why might he say that? And reflect Jesus in your interactions with others, making connections with others. Let me encourage you to do that. And let me hear from you. I'd love to hear your stories. I'd love to hear what God is doing in your life, in your mind, in your heart this week as you make connections. Let me offer a prayer on behalf of the Bridge Project before we jump into our sermon time today. Join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity. God, as we often say, as so many people say, these are strange times, but God, strange times sometimes make for unique opportunities. So God, help us this week to look for ways to connect with others in our community. Help us to see people, truly see them, to notice them, to see where they are and to join them, to help meet their needs, to point them ultimately to you, Father. Help us to make meaningful connections in the name of Christ. Help us to live as Jesus lived. Father, I pray that you would do mighty things through this church family this week. And for those things, and in those things, and because of those things, we give you all the glory and praise. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you have a Bible, you might open it up to John chapter 11. We're going to spend some time in the Gospel of John. John chapter 11. How many of you are self-diagnosed problem solvers? Some of you are, right? You fix things. That's what you do. You see a problem, you come up with a solution. Something is broken, you fix it. If there's an issue, if there's a question, you work toward a solution. That's what you do at work. That's what you try to do at home. But it doesn't always work, right? It's not always the best approach maybe you've learned. Right, fellas? Right, ladies? Sometimes the best approach is not, here's what you should do. Sometimes the best approach is, hmm, tell me more about that. You see, sometimes giving advice is not the best way to make a connection. And we find this to be true in marriage sometimes. I think the classic example, maybe you've seen the video, it's a great little video of a couple, and she expresses to her husband that she keeps feeling this pressure. Put that picture up there. She keeps feeling this, this pressure, and she keeps getting this, this stress and these headaches, and by the way, all of her sweaters are getting snagged, and he jumps in and he says, well, you know, you do have a nail sticking out of your forehead. Put that next picture up there. You do have a nail sticking out of your forehead. And she insists, it's not about the nail. Stop trying to fix it. I just need you to listen to me. <laughs> he says, no, I think what you really need is to take the nail out of your forehead. <laughs> I think that's a classic example of sometimes when we try to fix things, and maybe that's not the best approach. That is not the needed approach. Because the truth is, unsolicited advice is not always the best material for building a bridge. I mean, think about this for a minute. As we already said, our job is to imitate Jesus. Jesus didn't always just swoop in with the answers. I mean, if I would have been Jesus, that's what I'd have done. Because Jesus always had the answer. In every room he was in, he was the wisest person. When everyone else had questions, he had every answer to every question. I mean, think about that. 
If that had been me, I would have been giving answers out to everyone, solutions to everyone. But Jesus didn't always do that. Jesus often bridged the gap between where he was and where other people were, especially hurting people simply by going to them. Simply by crossing that bridge, by joining them where they were, by being on their turf, in the middle of their pain. He advocated for them. He blessed them. He served them. He helped them. He found ways to connect with people. A great example is in John chapter 11. Mary and Martha are sisters. They live with their brother, or he, I guess, lives nearby. Maybe they live in the same household. In Bethany, which is just about two miles east of the Mount of Olives near Jerusalem, and these sisters are concerned about their brother Lazarus because he is sick. He is very sick. Now, Bethany literally means house of the poor. And in many ways, that's what this town was. It was almost like a hospice on the outskirts of Jerusalem where many of the sick and the poor gathered, and congregated. Lazarus is sick, and they are worried about him. His sisters are. And they know a couple of things about Jesus, they know, first of all, that he cares for them. He cares for Lazarus. They know, secondly, that if anybody can do something to help their brother, it is Jesus. And so they send word to Jesus, the one you love is sick. Chapter 11, verse 4. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. When you read this passage, one of the things that you will notice is that Jesus often is on one level, his thinking, his words, his explanations, and humans in the story, us, people, are often on a different level. And they don't always connect. We don't always understand what Jesus is saying. We don't understand God's ways. Isaiah 55, his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. That is very evident throughout this passage. All Mary and Martha want is for Jesus to help their brother. That's all they want. But Jesus sees something bigger, doesn't he? He sees this as a platform to point people to God. He sees this sickness as an opportunity to give glory and praise to God. So often our prayers reflect our limited point of view, our limited view of reality. We want what we want, and we ask for what we think is best. And so we pray for things like, make us well, make us better, improve our marriage, get us a job, get us a better job, help us pass this test, put someone in my life whom I can love, who will love me, let my car start when I turn the key. We often pray for things from our limited perspective, but God sees not just one piece of the puzzle, he sees the entire thing, how it fits together, how everything is woven together in this beautiful tapestry of divine providence. That's what God sees. Jesus saw Lazarus' sickness as an opportunity, an opportunity for God to receive glory. So what does he do? He waits. (laughs) It's kind of unexpected. The text says he loves these sisters. He loves Lazarus, so he waits. That's the NIV translation. Other translations are a little bit different. But that's what Jesus does. He stays put, and he waits for two more days until he goes to see about Lazarus. And apparently, he doesn't really even in that moment say anything to his disciples. He doesn't necessarily send word back to Mary and Martha. He just waits, and I suspect he prays. And when it's time after two days to go back and check on Lazarus, this is the response he gets from his disciples. Verse 18, but rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back. 
His disciples say, wait just a second, Jesus, let us refresh your memory. You don't want to go back there. There are mean, mad people there with big rocks, and they want to throw them at you. And that means they're probably going to throw them at us. We don't want to go back there, do we? Why would Jesus do that? Why would he put himself at risk? Why? Because that's what love does. Love takes risks. Connecting with people demands sacrifice. You can't build a bridge and it not cost you something. Jesus knew that. And he went back because he cared about them. And he went back because, as we already said, he saw this as an opportunity to glorify God, to point people to God. And so Jesus tells his disciples that it's time to go check on his friend Lazarus. That Jesus is needed to go and wake him up because Lazarus is asleep. And they think, well, wait a second, if he's asleep, just let him use an alarm clock to wake up. Once again, different level thinking. Jesus isn't talking about literal sleep. Back in the text, verse 12. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. (laughs) Sometimes Jesus just had to level with them. Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Again, another example of this different level thinking. And then verse 16, Thomas said to the rest of his disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. Thomas says, if that's the case, we know what's waiting for us there. We're ready to go with you. We're ready to follow you, Jesus, even if it means we will all die. Isn't it unfortunate what Thomas is remembered for? What is Thomas's nickname? Doubting Thomas. After Jesus' resurrection, he needed to put his hands in the wounds of Jesus before he would believe. And so we call him Doubting Thomas. Why isn't he remembered for this incredible statement of faith? We will go and die with you, Jesus. Why isn't it Dying Thomas instead of Doubting Thomas? Well, that day no one would die. Well, except Lazarus. As Jesus and his disciples go into Bethany, they enter town, they find out that Lazarus is, in fact, dead. He is dead. He's been in the tomb for four days. You say, well, wait a second, that math doesn't add up. Well, if he died right after they sent messengers, and it took them a day to get to Jesus, and he waited two days, and it took him a day to get back, that would be four days. Whatever the case, Lazarus is dead. As Jesus enters town, verse 21, Martha goes to meet him. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. There's that word. That little two-letter word, if. If. It's the word that maybe you've spoken to God before. It's that word that haunts us sometimes. It's that word that anyone who has felt suffocated in sorrow or who has suffered from injustice knows. Martha gives voice to every believer who has ever been victimized by a broken world, who has ever said, if, God, if you just would answer my prayer, God, if you would just make the treatment work, if She just wouldn't have gotten behind the wheel if I'd married someone else, if I hadn't married at all, if these children would just obey, if I could get that job that I want. We know that word if. Maybe you've said it before. Maybe you've said it to the people around you. Maybe you've said it to God. If only God. And Jesus hears Martha, and he speaks this word of hope right in the middle of her lament. Notice what he says in verse 23. Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. 
Again, yet another example of sort of two different level thinking. Jesus is talking big picture. Jesus is talking about who he is, revealing his own identity. And again, Martha is just thinking about her brother. And most of the Jews, except for the Sadducees, believed in life after death. Isaiah 65, 66 talked about the new heaven and the new earth. And so even Martha here thinks, okay, I know someday he will live again. But Jesus invites her to reimagine what is in light of what is to come. And he says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. You see, what he was saying is, Martha, resurrection isn't just a doctrine. Resurrection isn't just a concept. It's not even just a future hope. It is a person standing right in front of you. I am the resurrection and the life. That is powerful. Jesus is saying, stop lamenting what could have been and start seeing what is and what will be. I'm not sure that Martha really wanted a theology lesson that day. All she really wanted was for her brother to be okay. And so she goes and gets her sister Mary so she can hear firsthand Jesus' explanation. Verse 32, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, and then here's that word again, if. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. If. But then the story takes this dramatic turn. Just when it it looks like Jesus will, will swoop in with the answer, with the solution, he'll stop all this misguided mourning, all these premature tears, all this what ifs and what could have been, that he'll put an end to it all by just snapping his fingers and bringing Lazarus back to life. What does he do? He stops. He pauses. He feels weeps. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then Jesus said, or then the Jews said, see how he loved him. You know, when we read this passage, and I'm sure you've read this passage before. It's every young child's memory verse. It's the go-to memory verse. It's the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. And so often when we read this passage, it's just like boom, 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 and we get through it in just a few seconds. But these events unfolded more slowly, more naturally, more organically. This is happening over some period of time. Jesus pauses everything, and he weeps with them. And he feels their pain. I wonder if maybe later the Holy Spirit put on the Apostle Paul this image of Jesus weeping when he wrote the words in Romans 12, 15, Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. The text says again that Jesus was deeply moved and troubled in spirit. It says that twice about Jesus. Literally, it means he was angry in spirit. Was he really angry? Was he angry at them for not believing in him? Was he angry at... What was he angry about? If he was angry about anything, I suspect he was angry about death, robbing joy from life. He was angry at Satan and evil. He was angry that there was so much evil in our world. That causes so much pain in our world. The text says that he's deeply moved, that he's troubled in spirit. And he says, as they approach the tomb, the burial place of this man Lazarus, remove the stone. And Martha reminds him, that's probably not a good idea, Jesus. He's been in there for four days. Removing that stone is going to be like taking a lid off some egg salad that's been at a picnic way too long. The stench of death will be overwhelming. But again, Jesus isn't concerned about human logic, about physical constraints. Jesus said, didn't I tell you? 
Didn't I tell you if you believe you're going to see the glory of God? Something big's about to happen. Don't worry about the smell. Smell can't stop him, and death certainly can't defeat him. So Jesus says a quick prayer to make it clear to everyone watching that he is connected to his heavenly Father, that the power is coming from God. And then he looks into the tomb of Lazarus and he says, Lazarus, come out. And what do you know? All of a sudden, this man comes out of that tomb wrapped in linen cloth. I always wonder, how did he walk out? I mean, it sounds like he looked like a mummy. Did he walk out with his arms straight? Did he sort of, you know, kind of trot out? Did he skip out? Did he run out? I I don't know. I mean, who was more surprised, the people who saw this or he himself who saw them looking at him? Hey, you were once dead. What an amazing sight to see. People there would never forget this. Death had been overcome by life. Hope had been restored. You see, that's what Jesus does. That's who Jesus is. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus said. But let me ask you a question as we sort of process some of this story. Let me ask you a question. If Jesus knew how the story was going to end, why did he weep? If he knew he was going to bring Lazarus back to life, and he knew that because, remember, he said, I'm going there to wake him up. This will be for the glory of God. I mean, Jesus knew what was going to happen. He knew the last chapter in Lazarus' story, or at least the next chapter. Why did he weep? Did he weep because he was sad Lazarus had died? Was he grieving the loss of his friend? Well, remember, he knew he was going to bring him back. I mean, people... I suspect people wouldn't cry at a funeral if they knew that in a couple of days their loved one would be alive again sitting at the dinner table with them. And Jesus knew that. So why did he cry? Why did he weep? I think Jesus wept because he felt the pain of those who were hurting. That's why he wept. You see, Jesus had a solution for the problem. He had an answer. He was the answer. But before he got to the solution, he took time to listen, to care, to mourn with those who mourn. Before he gave answers, Jesus gave himself. His time, his heart, his presence, his compassion, his empathy, even his tears. He sat with them in sorrow. You see, connection came before solutions. Empathy came before answers. I think that is so important for us as we think about making connections with other people. The text says that when he saw them, that's when he cried, that's when he was deeply moved, when he saw them. His tears were not for the one who died, his tears were for the ones who were grieving the one who died, the ones who were alive. Tears of compassion. In her book, Road Mac, Roadmap to Reconciliation. Brenda McNeil tells the heartbreaking story of a racially diverse group in a tour bus going to different places in the country that had a racial past and trying to learn from those experiences. And they went to one particular place that had a museum. And in this museum, there were all these disturbing photos of African Americans who had been lynched back in the day. Photo after photo, disturbing photo after disturbing photo. And in many of these photos, the white people in these images were depicted as giving their approval. In fact, even celebrating this tragic loss of life in front of them. Well, after the group looked at all these photos, they got back on the bus and it was completely silent. There was so much tension, so many different emotions. And finally, some of the the white people, some of the white students in the group began to speak up as if to create some kind of distance between themselves and the people they saw in the photos. After all, they hadn't done these things, and it had been many years ago. And then a young black student stood up very calmly, but with full emotion, shared her conviction that all white people are evil. Well, as you can imagine, that started all of this 
yelling and, and defending and all this commotion going on on the bus. <laughs> and then a young white female student stood up and said, I want to say something. I have something to say. And everyone sort of got quiet. And she said, I don't know what to do with those pictures I saw. I don't know what to do with that. And she looked at some of her black friends on the bus. She said, I can't, I can't take away your pain. I can't remove it. I don't know what to do with it, but I can see it. I can see it. And she said, I promise I'll do everything I can to keep this from happening to you and to your children someday. I'll do everything I can. And she began to cry. And as she began to shed tears, her mascara began to streak on her face. No one said a word. They just watched her standing there crying. And then one of the group leaders stood up and said, look, look at her. Noticing that her dark mascara was just streaming across her face. She said, she is crying black tears. And she was. One of the things I have learned over the past several months as I have tried to be more educated and more aware of our history as a country with race and racism and our history in the church with those issues is that sometimes, many times, the best thing to do is simply to listen. Listen to people's stories. So many times we want to defend and we want to create distance and we want to explain and we want to have answers and we want to say, well, here's what you should do or this wasn't us. Or, and sometimes we just need to keep our mouths shut and listen and mourn with those who mourn. This is true in so many areas of life, not just when it comes to, to race. I know this to be true when it comes to, to grief, the grief that's associated with the loss of loved ones, the loss of people close to us. I have seen it from both sides of the equation, from someone trying to minister to people who've lost loved ones, and also someone who has experienced incredible grief at loss. And I can tell you, because I know this has happened to me, that all those good words, like, God just needed another angel, those aren't helpful. Or Romans 8, 28, God works in all things for the good of those who love him. Write that down, go to that. Yeah, but in that moment, that's not incredibly helpful. When you look at Job's story in the Old Testament, Job lost everything. He was devastated. Everything. And in chapter 2, his friends make the long trip to be with him. And it says that they just sat with him. They sat on the ground with him. And no one said a word. And they realized how much pain he had, how much sorrow he had. They didn't say a word. They just sat there for seven days and seven nights. They just sat with him in his sorrow. That's the best thing they did. Because right after that, they started opening their mouths, and that's when things didn't go so well. You see, meaningful connections, meaningful connections are made when we simply join people where they are. That sounds so simple, and yet that is so profound. It is transformative. When we have enough self-awareness, when we have enough faith in God to provide answers so that we don't necessarily have to rush in with ours, and we just simply take the risk, leave the comfort zone, join people where they are, empathize, and listen. God can do amazing things to build strong connections and trust so that we can point them to Christ so that we can share the gospel with them so that we can give them a reason for the hope that we have if you want to build a bridge the strongest bridges are built with the foundation of empathy and understanding empathy and understanding let me just give you a word of caution though empathy is not a license to turn the story to you you know what I'm talking about. 
You're trying to listen to someone, you're trying to understand someone, and they say, yeah, this is what happened. Well, yeah, I can relate because let me tell you my story of what happened. And all of a sudden, it's about me and my story. Now, yes, it's okay to share part of your story, and that's not what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. Seek to understand, as someone has said, before being understood. Meet people where they are. The strongest bridges are built on the foundation of empathy and understanding. One more story. There's a uh, Chicago Tribune article from several years back that highlights a lady named Mrs. Betty Tucker. They just called her Mrs. Betty. She actually worked in the Children's Hospital in Chicago for 50 years. For many of those years, she had the night shift. She wasn't a doctor. She wasn't a nurse. She wasn't an administrator. She was a cook in the cafeteria of the hospital. She loved working the night shift, and she would say how much she would interact with the parents, and she would meet parents who were in such grief and stress, and they're in the waiting room waiting on their child to undergo an eight-hour brain surgery or a, another parent whose kid had a, a rare form of leukemia or parents who were with their children who had these accidents. And, and you can imagine what she encountered in 50 years of working at this hospital. But people described her heart. They described how she treated people in the hospital, patients and nurses and doctors and everyone there. And when they would go to the cafeteria to eat, someone said it's like they would walk into her small kitchen in her own home and she would just feed them with love. She was a joyful lady. She would ask the parents, how are you doing today? And many many times the parents would say, today's not a good day. And she would say, don't lose hope. And she would ask the nurses, how's it going today? And they'd say, today's not a good day. And she'd say, I'm here for you. If you need something, I'm here for you. She was constantly lifting people up. She was also a woman of prayer. And every night, she would pray for the hospital. She would pray starting at the basement. And she would work her way up, praying for every room, every patient, praying for everyone in that hospital. As I said, she wasn't a doctor. She never did surgery on anyone. She wasn't a nurse. She never prescribed medicine. She never diagnosed. She never read an x-ray. She fed people. But as one of the people in the housekeeping staff said about Miss Betty, when you needed life, she would give you life in the middle of the night. She would give you life. Again, she didn't save anyone's life by doing surgery. She didn't literally give life, but she gave life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus gave life. And if we are going to be in him, we are going to live as he did, and we have life to give. Will you give life this week as you make meaningful connections in the name of Christ, as you join people where they are, as you empathize and understand and listen? When you do that, you're reflecting Jesus. And I can assure you, God will work through that to do transformative, amazing things. As I said at the beginning of our service, maybe you're at the point where you're, you've been contemplating, okay, is this real? Do I really want to live my life for Jesus? There's no better way to live. You were created to live this life, a life in Christ. So make that decision to give your life to Christ, to turn everything over to him, to receive the forgiveness that comes through the blood of Jesus, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. To tell the world you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. To be baptized into Christ. There's no better way to live. It's the very life you were created to live. Maybe today's your day. If we can help you in some way, if we can encourage you, if we can lift you up, if we can walk alongside you, please let us do that. If you're at home, go to our website, our prayer page, reach out. If you're here, you can do the same thing or you can come forward today.
you have an opportunity to receive life and to give life. Will you do that? Let's stand and sing.